So the, uh, we've been doing this prodigal series, and uh, if you haven't been here, or if, just as a quick reminder, over here on the side, left side for me, right side for you, is a board that is full of names, a couple hundred different names of people that we are standing in faith, praying for them to come back home. Some of them are children and grandchildren, some of them are spouses, parents, siblings, friends, whoever they are, we've been praying for them over the last month and there's been, the, the church building's been open during the days. Many of you have come and prayed. Um, we, we will be concluding that, like having the circle set up and the music on, but anybody that wants to come by and pray, these names will remain up at least through the end of the year. So at least through uh, Christmas time, we're gonna keep that up and you can come at any time and pray. If you'll notice though, there are some names on the board that have circles around them, and that in part is because there have been a couple of testimonies of, I've been praying and I started to see this thing happen, I got a phone call, I got, uh, had an interaction that was really positive, and because of that, I said to the people, hey, well, put, your, put a circle around the name just as a way of indicating that the Lord is moving, because it will encourage others that see those circles to keep on praying as well. So, friends, if you have some motion or movement that you can see, discern, Put a circle around that name as well um, because it is an encouragement to others. Let's pray for them. Lord, you love them more than we do. We can't even wrap our minds around how much you love them. As much as we're standing and watching and waiting and praying, you you are more so. You have been from the, the beginning of time waiting for them to come home. And so, Lord, we ask that you would give us the grace to continue to wait and look and stand and watch by faith. And, Lord, that you would move upon their hearts. May they have that pig pen moment where they see clearly and repent fully and come back home. We pray for them this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, this morning we're going to focus on the older son. So the first week we kind of did an overview, then we focused on the younger son, and then we focused on the father last week. This morning we're going to look at the older son, and I'm going to, yes, once more, read you the whole parable, mainly because it's the best parable and it's so good, but... Let me read it to you this morning out of the Christian Standard Bible, CSB. Here's what it says. A man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me a share of the estate that I have coming to me. And so he distributed the assets to them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered together all that he had and traveled to a distant country where he squandered his estate in foolish living. After he had spent everything, a severe famine struck the country, and he had nothing. Then he went to work for one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the field to feed pigs. And he longed to eat his fill from the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one would give him anything. Verse 17, key verse. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food? And here I am dying of hunger. I'll get up. Go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired workers. So he got up and went to his father. Another key verse. But while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and threw his arms around his neck and kissed him. And the father said to him, I'm sorry, the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Verse 22, but the father told his servants, quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then bring the fattened calf and slaughter it. And let's celebrate with a feast because this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so they began to celebrate. Verse 25, Now the older son was in the field, and as he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. And so he summoned one of the servants, questioning what these things meant. Your brother is here, he told him, and your father has slaughtered the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and didn't want to go in. And so his father came out and pleaded with him. But he replied to his father, look, I have been slaving many years for you and I have never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me a goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has devoured your assets with prostitutes, but when this son of yours came, who has devoured your assets with prostitutes, you slaughtered the fattened calf for him. Verse 31, son, he said to him, you are always with me and everything I have is yours, but we had to celebrate and rejoice 
because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. My favorite parable for sure. So good. Now that older son is, um, you know, on the surface, the older son is good. I mean, he does good things. He's a, he's a good boy. He's a dutiful son. He stays at home. He's responsible. He keeps working. He doesn't dishonor the father by trying to make an early withdrawal on the inheritance. The older son doesn't ask for that. That's the younger son. Apparently, he doesn't go through a rebellious season where he needs to go out and find himself and blow his life up and then come back. He didn't go through that. Apparently, he remains faithful. He appears to in the text. But when you read the interaction with the father at the end of the story, when you read how they go back and forth, it's troubling. His words to his dad, his reaction to his brother's resurrection is disheartening. It's sad. There's a bitterness there that is, can be felt when you're reading it, which is why when I read this story, I think there's not one lost son. There are two lost sons. There are two sons that need to come home, at least metaphorically. So I want to look at the older brother with you. I, when you look at the older brother's reaction, verse 29, it's just one verse. Uh, his initial reaction to, this, to his younger brother coming into, the, into good relationship, coming into relationship with his father at this party that's going on, his reaction is threefold. He says three different things I want you to see. He says first, he says, look, talking to his dad, he says, look, I have been, the CSB says, I have been slaving for you. I have been slaving, which is probably, it's not, not the best word to use to your dad, but I've been slaving for you. In other words, I have always worked. Would you say those two words with me? I have always worked. Verse 29, he says, I have never disobeyed you. I have never disobeyed you. In other words, I have always obeyed. He's always worked. He's always obeyed. And then he says, but you never gave me a goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. He was never rewarded. So in, in, in summary, six words, he says, I have always worked. I have always obeyed. I have never been rewarded. Now, I don't know about you. But always and never are trigger words. Because if Susan says to me, you always do this, I will tell you where my mind goes. Always? Every single time? No, I don't think so. Maybe 99 times out of 100, but not every time, which always leads us into one of our every four-year arguments, you know? We have a good argument. We start the runaway never and always, start throwing those around in our conversation. It never goes well. So this, you should never use never or always, okay? It's always a bad idea to use never and always, yeah. But you understand what I'm saying? This, this kid is, is, uh, is self-focused to an extreme degree. Everything that he says about his brother's return is about himself. He is entirely self-focused. He cannot self-focused. He can't see beyond his needs. He can't see beyond his wants. He is missing the miracle that is right in front of him. It's right there. His brother has been away for some length of time, doing all kinds of terrible things, being treated as though he were dead by the father. And he, he is resurrected. He is in the house. He's no longer lost. He's found. And all this guy can say is, I didn't get a goat. I worked for you so hard. I never disobeyed you. Now, he feels dishonored. He feels unappreciated. He's been loyal, and yet in his brain, there's not been any, any recognition or any affirmation of that. Somehow he managed to make his brother's miracle about himself. And we, do we know people like that? It doesn't matter what goes on. They're going to find a way to take that thing and turn it into a story about them. And sometimes it's kind of innocent and humorous, and sometimes it's as annoying as all get out. That's this brother. He made his brother's you know, incredible story about himself. Now, I, I'm not suggesting for one second that I don't see the points that the older brother is making. Of course, we're not foolish. We get it. He was dutiful. He was responsible. He was hardworking. He did stay around. But the extreme nature of his comments, there's not even a recognition that this is a positive thing. He doesn't say, yeah, that's really good that, that, that Junior came home. But dad, it's not even that. It's just boom, right at it. This is all about what I don't get. And when you read that, 
you read his response, it reveals the real, uh, really reveals a larger issue in the older son's life. The older son is doing the right things. Hear me say this. He is doing the right things, but he is doing them for the wrong reasons. Jot this down in your notes. The older brother lives in the same house as the father, but he doesn't have the same heart as the father. He's in the house. He's, he's looking correct. He's looking like the, the part of the dutiful, good faithful son, but his heart is far from his dad. His heart is far from what is right. And really, right, the, the heart is what matters. That's what God's always concerned about. That's what that father was concerned about. And so this older son, he needs his own breakthrough moment. He needs his own epiphany in the pig pen. He needs his own scales falling off of his eyes, self-awareness, repentance. He needs perspective on what matters most. Now, this can happen to any of us and does happen to all of us at some level, Where we can be in our family situation or you can be in a a friendship kind of a deal or maybe it's a church place where you just, you and I can get in a place where we resent the fact that people don't appreciate what we do and what we have done. I'm not going to make you raise your hands for that, but everybody in this room has had at least the temptation in their lives to get a bitter spirit like this older brother had because we haven't felt appreciated. It can feel like in our lives that our faithfulness is being taken for granted It's maybe being even unnoticed. And those kinds of feelings can feel very justified. I'm affirming to you this morning that if you've ever felt that way, it is an understandable feeling. It can feel very very righteous and, and justified. But here's the deal. Even the faithful sons that stay at home need the same mercy applied to their lives as the sons who run away. And see, that's the problem, is that, is that the older brother does not see that. He, he honestly and truly thinks that he is better than his brother, that he is stronger than his brother, that he is more faithful than his brother, that he is more obedient than his brother. And because he cannot see his own weaknesses, he can't see his own foibles, he can't see his own faults, because of that, he is unable to give that grace to his brother. How we view ourselves is directly, that directly influences how we see and therefore treat other people. Think about it. If the, the older brother was humble and honest and self-aware, he would have said, what? My brother's home? And he would have gone straight into the house. He would have probably found his little brother because the big brother's always, well, most of the time the big brother's bigger and picked him up and gave him a bear hug and said, what are you doing, you knucklehead? It's so good to see, you know, or whatever. He'd give him a noogie, whatever they would do. That's what older brothers do. He would have gone right into the house and had that experience. But the problem is he's better than his brother in his mind. He doesn't think that that kid is due any of those things because in his mind, he never needed any grace because he never left home. He was always, always obedient. He cannot see himself accurately and therefore he cannot be charitable towards his brother. Though the older brother lives in the house with the father, he doesn't understand the culture of the home. He doesn't grasp how dad feels about, him, about himself or about his brother. His reaction in this story betrays that. And if I could just say it this bluntly with you this morning, that older brother is a brat. Would you turn to the person next to you and say, that kid is a brat. He has a bratty attitude. He is a brat. There are harsher words we could use, but we'll stick with brat. He's a stinker. He, when he hears about the brother from the servant... He, I don't know how it went down, but let, give me a little license here. I, he digs, he's in the front yard. He's like, I'm not going in. He's being a little stinker. He's being a brat. He's being a baby. I'm not going to go in there. I'm not going to celebrate him. And the, the story is so rich because just in the same way that the father ran down the road to hug the younger son and bring him home, the father comes out of the house to the older brother. And it, the text says he pleads with him. Now, this is, again, first century Palestine. Fathers are, this is a patriarchal society. Fathers are very high up, very honored. They don't run. They don't go outside and negotiate with older sons either. But he comes and his, the tenderness of his heart is revealed. He comes to his son and he's, he's just trying, come on, please come in. This is such a good thing. But that, younger, that older brother cannot wrap his head around grace. He can't wrap his head around how his dad's heart works, what the, what the culture of the house is like. And, and we struggle with that too some. 
hear me out when I say this, but Christianity, following Jesus, being a believer and a follower of Jesus, is a scandalous proposition. There is so much about Christianity that in one sense seems unfair or unreasonable or unrealistic or impossible. I mean, it's in the, it's in the kingdom of God that virgins can have babies. That doesn't happen, but it does happen. It's in the kingdom of God that the creator becomes the creation. Scripture says that all things were made through Jesus and nothing was made that was made if it wasn't through the Lord. And yet he becomes this baby put into a a womb. In the kingdom, the, the first people get to be last, or I should say have to be last, and the last people get to be first. Talk about unjust. I showed up early. I wanted to, what if you had showed up on Tuesday to vote? I think the line here went down the sidewalk, all the way down into the parking lot. What if Ken, our election master here at Grace, before the doors were opened at six o'clock, there's, I don't know, let's just pretend there was 200 people in line. What if he went all the way to the end and brought a person all the way up to the front and put him in front of the person who was actually here an hour early at five o'clock. Somebody was in line at five o'clock. That is a very patriotic person. So what if he had done that? What do you think the reaction would have been? Oh, by all means. (laughs) Not. That's the kingdom. It's just a scandal. In the kingdom, the leaders, the great leaders are the servants. And on and on and on it goes. And the biggest scandal of all is grace. And people who have ruined their lives and, as a bonus, ruined the lives of others get forgiveness. The people who who run up debts, financial and otherwise, too large to repay, get them erased. That That the worst of humanity, the worst of humanity, is not only tolerated but welcomed into the presence of God, who is holy. The people that don't deserve favor get favor anyway, but it's not even because of their good works. It's simply because of faith. This is grace. And for the older brother, it exasperates him. See, grace exasperates those who want to earn their way. They want to earn their righteousness through behavior instead of receiving it by faith. It makes people who are self-righteous and well-behaved crazy because it's so unfair. This parable is one stunning picture of grace after another. I got to share one more with you. Remember when last week when the father ran down the road and the son, you know, when the son has the pig pen epiphany, when he's thinking and, and he's trying to figure out what he's going to say to his dad, he rehearses his, he rehearses his, his little spiel, right? Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to become, worthy to be your son. Take me as one of your hired servants. That's the three lines. Kid, the kid walks, he goes back, he's coming down the road, the father sees him, the father hikes up his, you know, his, the, the, the bottom of his, of his uh, robe, and he runs to the son, and the son starts with the thing, right? Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you, I'm no longer worthy to be your son. He hasn't even finished his pre-rehearsed lines, and the, the, the father interrupts him. And the father says, quick, to the servant, go get the best robe, and put it on him. Now I have a question for you. At that exact moment. What had the younger son done in terms of his behavior to deserve the best robe? Nothing. All he did was repent. All he did was say, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy. And the father says, put the best robe on him. That is grace. He didn't get the robe because he won the behavior contest. He got the robe because he believed the father would take him back, and the father did. Just an act of repentance, just a a declaration from his heart, and he goes from being the pig tender to being the restored and honored son of the father, living in the house. If you're looking, if I'm looking, if we are looking for fairness... It will never be found in the Father's house and it will never be found in the kingdom of God. It is not a fair proposition at all. What's fair? 
Fair is this young guy never gets to come back home because he made a bunch of bad decisions and he has to live the rest of his life estranged from his dad because of those foolish decisions that he made. It is, that, that would be fair. Would we agree that that would be fair? That is what is actually fair. You and I do not want fairness. What do we say in our vernacular? We say things like this. You made your bed. You lie in it, right? You created this mess. Deal with it. I cannot tell you. There is nothing. There are few statements that we use regularly that are further from the heart of God and further from the realities of the kingdom. The realities of the kingdom is you made that bed. Come home anyway. Right? That's the best thing of all. Jot this down. Final fill in. In God's kingdom, neither son, neither the older nor the younger, are allowed in the house based on their behavior. Because in the, in the kingdom, the standard is perfection and there's only one perfect son. Jesus alone is the perfect son. All the other sons and daughters must have the righteousness of God applied to their lives. In other words, all of us and everybody else who's ever called on the name of the Lord had the same experience. We had to have the robe placed around our shoulders because we weren't good enough on our own. And God says, that's completely fine. I have taken care of that for you. Last thing I want to point out before we finish is this, is that when the, when the stinker of an older brother, the brat, is standing in the yard and the dad comes out to talk with him, he begins to plead with him. You know what he doesn't do? He doesn't rebuke the older brother. I'm not talking about shame. Remember, we talked about that. I'm not talking about I mean. He didn't, of course he doesn't shame, but he doesn't even rebuke the older brother. He could have easily corrected that. I was going to call him a punk. Can I do that? He could have easily corrected the punk older brother. Like, you're out of line. You need to get your act together. Would you have done that? I would have totally done that. What on earth are you? You want to live in this house? You know, I would have just gotten, I'd have gotten all parental on him. You know, I'd have just started leveraging. He didn't do that. He doesn't do that. The kid's being a real brat and he just appeals to him. We had to celebrate because the father sees it. He was dead and now he's alive. He was truly lost. Now he's home. We had to celebrate. It had to happen. It's interesting to me that there's no response recorded in the text. Like, don't you wish you got to hear what happened? Like, the father has laid it out here. He served up this perfect opportunity for the oldest son to be repentant and come into the house. But we don't know what happens. And I think the reason is this. If you go back to the very beginning of Luke chapter 15, the first few verses talk about the setting for the three stories. Remember, lost sheep, lost coin, lost son. He is speaking, Jesus is speaking in the midst of tax collectors and sinners. They would be the younger sons who've come home. But he is speaking to the Pharisees and the scribes. And they are the older son that have to make a decision. This whole story is pointed at those leaders, those religious leaders who, who think highly of themselves, who think they are good, who think they are dutiful and faithful, just like the older son of the story. It's all presented to them as an invitation. Will you come into the house? Let your judgment go. Let your self-righteousness go. Let your false motives go and come home. And we don't see the answer because they needed to make that decision. And I, I want us this morning to make that decision too. Because if you remember several weeks ago, I said, if you, if you know the Lord Jesus, you have responded like the younger son. At some point in your life, you had an on-the-road interaction with the Lord. You, you were embraced and got the righteousness of, of Christ placed upon you. That's awesome. But what happens over time for many people, I won't say all, but for most of us, what happens over time is that we can so easily, we can so easily morph into being the older sons if we don't guard our hearts. That's a huge danger in the church is that we forget what it was like to be the younger son and we start thinking, I've been here, I've been working, I've been slaving, I've been faithful. Where's my party? So easily we can do that. It's just, I don't know why that is. I wish I understood how that happens to us, but it, it just does. I was telling the first service, I, during the whole election cycle, I mean, we're just, we're just prone to judgment, most of us. Not all of us. Some of you are awesome. I am not. 
And during the election cycle, I'd run in my neighborhood, and I was running back and forth up and down the streets and see particular signs in people's yards, and I'm like, see other signs like, what's wrong with them? <laughs> I don't know them. Yeah. I don't know anything about them. Oh, well, my little Pharisee heart just rises up, though. That's in us. We, we, we appoint ourselves at some point in that transition from younger to older, we become the, the behavior police for other people. And I'm not, friends, don't think for one second I'm suggesting that there isn't right and wrong. There absolutely is. What I want us to appreciate this morning is that it is not our place to be the ones who define that for other people and who push them about it. What we need to do is embody the heart of the Father embracing sons when they come home. The Lord will deal with them. We will stand in the middle. I'm not suggesting that we're we're just gonna be a church that says anything goes. God just wants you to come to church. It doesn't matter what you do. That's not true. That's not true biblically. But it's not my job nor your job to be the one that's the enforcer. It's my job to love people well. It's my job to listen to people. It's my job to pray for people, not to be a little judgment policeman. So I wanna pray this morning. Hopefully you're like, I've never been the judgment policeman, but probably a bunch of you have at different times. So I'd like to pray that we not take on that older son mantle, but rather we stay like the younger son. And if we become the older son, Let's repent our way back into the house this morning. Would you stand with me, please? Just close your eyes and let's pray together. Father, uh, first of all, thank you for your word that is so powerfully able to remind us and draw us back. And so this morning, Lord, we confess to you that it is very easy for us to become the older son. And we want to respond the right way to this story in our relationship with you. Lord, forgive us for thinking more highly of ourselves than we ought. Forgive us for thinking we don't need the grace as much now as we did then. Lord, we know more now. <laughs> we know more about ourselves and about the, how, how unpleasant and broken we actually are at times, Lord. And so we need your grace even more. Give us the ability to see our need and to relate to others in such a way that we are seeing their need and praying for them, loving them, and drawing them to you, Lord. Our world does not need more judgment policemen. It needs more people willing to love deeply like you do. So may that be us, Lord. May that be us. I trust, Lord, this morning that as we've walked through this parable over and over and over again, you're doing something inside of us. May we have a renewed sense of optimism and hope, a a renewed height of faith to see the prodigals come back to you. May it stay in front of us and may we continue to share openly and honestly with others about who we're contending for. I pray these things this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Elders and prayer team members, if you would come, that would be fantastic. And I want to bless you before you go this morning. If you are here and you do not know the Lord Jesus personally, you've never, you've never prayed and said, Lord, I want, to, I want to come into the house. We would be so happy to talk with you. Not because we're perfect, but because we know how good it is inside. It is the best. Would you extend your hands in front of you? I want to bless you in the name of the Lord. Grace Church family and friends and visitors and guests, may the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and may he give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen.